All right, it's time to talk Atlanta Falcons football as we recap the 2022 NFL draft, as many teams as we can get through. And, of course, Atlanta Falcons football is always a part of it. Uh, you can check out not only the Atlanta Falcons, but the other 31 teams on our, our last draft review guide that will be coming out in about a month and a half or so. And the Atlanta Falcons, as you know, part of – uh, the teams that I'm responsible for. So that's why Kevin Knight is so kind to come on here and help me out. Uh, inside information on everything Atlanta Falcons football. Uh, of course, Kevin is with the Falcoholic.com and you can check out his Falcoholic Live podcast on YouTube. Is that a daily show, Kevin? It's not daily. Right now we're doing two a week, uh, one on Mondays approximately, and then the Wednesday night show is the live broadcast at eight. So. Yeah, I always get that wrong. Every time I say to somebody, is that a, is that a, a, a weekly show? They go, it's a daily. And I go, is that a yeah. daily show? It's, it's my, I, I got to just yeah. stop that. They're so. pushing me to do daily. I'm just telling them, like, there's nowhere near enough content for that right now. Yeah. So, like, you're just going to have to lot. wait on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's get started. And, you know, I got to tell you, I went through – and by the way, Drake London, I don't know about you, but that was one of the ones I got right in the first round. Yep. I know a lot of people were thinking quarterback – and Willis and all that and the connections and such. But we talked about it, about how dire this program is and getting receivers. So it just made too much sense to go receiver. And now let me ask you about that because what I kept telling everybody was I really firmly believe that they are going to be looking at 2023 with all the money they're going to have. The fact that, all right, you're not going to have a great year. Who cares? Next season, you get a high draft pick. You can go after one of those two superstar quarterbacks. Um, and then all of a sudden, the team winds up getting Desmond Ritter in the third round, which is perfect because you never know. Maybe he works out. You don't have to get one of those superstar quarterbacks. But uh, the fact was, is that was the plan all along, wasn't it? Was to kind of just be patient. We've got a you know relatively new coaching staff and GM. So we're going to do this for the long haul. And I thought it was very smart, and I just absolutely love their draft. And we'll go over that. Uh, but uh, how, how did how, how did that take as far as the fan base was concerned, their strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think the wide receiver at the top was a little bit contentious, not because of Drake London. Like, I, I mean, Drake London was my favorite receiver in the class. He was my wide receiver one. My 10th overall player, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and I was still someone who was, like, sort of against wide receiver at eight just because – I was wanting them to beef up, you know, the defensive line and stuff like that. But it's not at all about Drake London, the player. Drake London, the player is awesome. Um, obviously does fill a big need for them. It was more like philosophically going back to back weapons, you know, offensive weapons in, in back to back drafts when you have, you know, major needs on the offensive and defensive sure. lines was a little bit contentious. But I think it's hard to be it's really hard to be upset with Drake London. Drake London's an awesome player. Uh, I love that pick. I think he he certainly fits the mold of what Arthur Smith sort of looks for. You know, if you've seen what who they've brought in this offseason, you know, Auden Tate, Brian Edwards, they just traded for, uh, you know, all these guys, the, the huge receivers, you know, 6'4", 6'3", 6'5". They got Kyle Pitts, you know, 6'6". Six, six. So uh, he wants these skyscrapers out there to really test your size in the secondary. Um, and obviously, London's very physical. Um, they're really, I think they're really trying to, to, remake this receiving core into a more physical unit that's also going to be able to contribute uh, in the run game as well. Well, yeah, let's talk about the Brian Edwards trade because that didn't happen last week. You know, it just happened. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was actually talking um, to our Raider analyst about it uh, a couple weeks ago and I, I was like, I don't understand it. What happened to Brian Edwards last year? I, I thought he was going to have a big year. And as we're on the same fantasy dynasty league. I picked him. I thought he was going to do well. And then he told me that there's a lot of separation issues. That's been a problem. And, it, you know, Derek Carr didn't trust because he can't separate and all that. And I don't know. I, okay. Maybe there, that's the one thing he's got to do a better job of, but maybe this is what he needed to change the scenery. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to me, it was weird that he wasn't more productive. I mean, I think he was obviously the third target, I believe, last year for them with Darren Waller being the top guy, Hunter Renfro just sucking up all these targets in the slot. Um, 
But, you know, Edwards, you would think, would have had a bigger role in that offense. The stats were, were good. I mean, his uh, yards per reception was like almost 17. I think it was 16.8, um, 571 or something like that yards and three touchdowns. So it's not for a second year receiver. That's not bad for a third round receiver. It's certainly encouraging. So to me, it didn't, you know, obviously the Raiders traded for Devonte Adams this off season. He's going to be their number one guy, but yeah. outside of Adams and Renfro, you would still think that Edwards was in line to be the number three receiver. You know, I know they brought in Mac Hollins and Keelan Cole, but I'm sorry, those guys aren't necessarily, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to bench Brian Edwards for those guys, no. but, um, trading him for just a fifth and they sent the Falcons a seventh too, you know, and who cares about sevens, but it, like it, you're not, that's not a good value trade for them. Um, you, you need depth at receiver too. Like say Adams has to miss a game or two or Renfro has to miss a game. Now you're, now you're forced to, to start Mac Hollins and when you could have had Brian Edwards. So for a team that's competing like the Raiders, it really didn't make a lot of sense to me to get such poor return on a third round pick from two years ago. Falcons got him on rookie contract for two more seasons. Uh, yeah, so, there had, that's, that's why I was saying there had to be something else. Maybe we'll yeah. start hearing about it when he maybe. gets his interviews and all that. If the reporters dig deep, maybe they'll find something because maybe he was <laughs> about to be, you know, a distraction in camp, you know. So, yeah, I just think it's Josh McDaniels. You know, he's just on his way to ruin another football team. So. <laughs> <laughs> you got that, too. All right. Yep. So uh, London uh, and, and they have no problem, by the way, with his ankle injury. No, no, he's great at minicamp. Um, look, look healthy, look fine. So no issues there. Okay, uh, I tell you what, let's uh, let's stay with uh, offense and let's talk about um, Algier, the BYU uh, bruiser, the former linebacker. Uh, now it, it just simply looks like he's going to be a short yardage type of back, goal line, you know, short yardage situations. Uh, is that how you see it as well? Was this like a fit for that specific role? Yeah. I mean, I think obviously you look at his college production, 23 rushing touchdowns last year, red zone monster play behind a really, really good offensive line at BYU. So he's probably not going to get that in Atlanta this year, but um, a guy that really fits the Arthur Smith mold, you know, 220 plus pounds, physical, great contact balance, good vision, uh, explosive, not necessarily tremendous long speed, fairly average for an NFL running back, but uh, got the explosiveness. Um, and I, I think he's probably, you know, I don't know how early in the season it'll happen, but I think the the goal is for him to sort of take, take on the grinder role, take on a lot of the carries, especially on early downs. Um, and sort of leave quarter all Patterson for those high leverage situations, leave him for the third downs for, you know, those really important plays. Uh, there's been rumblings that Patterson might play more as a receiver, or they might do more, some interesting two running back sets, uh, where Cor Patterson flexes out to, to receiver sometimes and that sort of thing. So I think the goal is for Algier to sort of take on that grunt work, take on those carries so that Patterson, who you know, was very productive. He did start to wear down over the course of the season. He's not, you know, a long-term running yeah. back. This is a guy that's not used to taking that sort of volume of carries. Um, so I think you sort of want to cap Patterson's workload in terms of the running game to a certain yes. amount. But in terms of a receiver, I think they're still going to use him a lot. But Algier, the idea, I think, is to have him take on a lot of that, those, those early down grinder sort of carries. Were you surprised that they haven't added another runner because at this point, Damian Williams is there and he's just, uh, you know, he's, he's a holdover type of <laughs> he's guy. Fine. He's fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think honestly they're, they're satisfied with that. You know, Patterson is going to be the nominal starter. We've seen what he can do. Um, and I think taking some of that grunt work off his plate should help keep him fresher. Um, you know, I think Damian Williams is a fine committee back. Uh, you know, when he's gotten chances to start and play, he did a really good job in Kansas city. Uh, I think he's a good pass protector, good third down guy. I think he'll he'll factor in. And then I think Algier is the guy they want to eventually carry the load on the ground. Um, and then in terms of the depth, like like you said, they didn't really bring in any UDFAs or anything like that. No. I think they they like the competition they have between Quadri Olison and uh, Caleb Huntley for that last spot. I guess Huntley was really impressive at minicamp from what I was hearing. So, um, you know, we'll see. Olison, I think, averaged like five yards per carry on, you know, 20 carries last year. So he's intriguing too, but I think they're, they're sort of satisfied with that. And I think the idea is that they'll sort of ride Patterson for another year or so, see what they get in Algier. And then if it's still looking like they need more, 
we know how important the running game is to Arthur Smith. So they uh, they may very well invest in a running back, you know, on day two or, or high next year in what might be a better overall class. OK, so, so no Devonta Freeman reunions. <laughs> I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, let, there's always the chance, right, if you get injuries or something like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, probably not. OK. And then the other player uh, skill position player was the last pick, uh, John Fitzpatrick. So wh- wh- where does he fit in? Yeah, uh, blocking specialist at Georgia. Uh, from what I've heard, he has good hands, but they didn't really throw him the ball. I mean, Georgia Georgia has a really deep tight end group, so they didn't necessarily need him to catch a lot of passes. But uh, sort of reminds of uh, Levine Toilolo, who the Falcons drafted a, while, a long time ago. Sort of a stat, you know, this really tall, big blocking specialist. You know, Fitzpatrick's over six seven. Um, so they're he's going to be their sort of Lee Smith replacement, the guy that's going to be their their blocker can catch a couple dump offs here and there, but yeah, they, they needed a blocking specialist. You know, they have pits who, and you don't really want pits blocking that much. You know, you want him running routes. Um, they do have, uh, Anthony Ferkser who came over from Tennessee, but again, a guy who's probably going to be better for you as a receiver. And then they have Parker Hesse who, who Smith really likes. And he was a solid blocker last year, but they're lacking that sort of blocking specialist. And I think that's what Fitzpatrick is going to bring. Okay. Uh, next up is Desmond Ritter. So, four-year starter, AAC Offensive Player of the Year, seen his record and how many, you know, he's a winner, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Didn't get an opportunity a whole lot to play against the big boys, but did the last couple of years play in those big games at the end of the season. So, you know, he was tested there. Uh, I just, look, uh, I, I, I think it was great for the NFL overall to see these quarterbacks like Ritter like Matt Corral, drafted really where they should have been drafted all along. And it does not mean that they can't develop into starting caliber quarterbacks. It's just talent-wise, how many years we got to go down this road where reach, reach, reach on these quarterbacks because everybody wants a quarterback. So it, everybody seemed to be patient this time around, and it benefited the Falcons. So <laughs> yeah. uh, the fans had to be stoked to get this guy in the third round. Yeah, I mean, I certainly valued him as like a second rounder. Um, so to get him... And the third is, is terrific value. Um, and it's it's weird that like every team sort of agreed to just not draft quarterbacks for a while. Um, so uh, I'll take that. Um, Ritter was definitely the guy that I thought was the Falcons target based on he was, I think, one of their first interviews at the Senior Bowl. Um, you know, we, we heard I saw Arthur Smith chatting with uh, Luke Fickle, the Cincinnati head coach on the C- Senior Bowl sideline for like hours uh, one practice. So this was the, the tea leaves were sort of there for, for them, their interest in Ritter. He certainly fits what they want to do. And um, I think it'll be interesting to see how quickly he can get up to speed. That's sort of his calling card is his work ethic and leadership and all that. Um, he's really been vocal about like, look, you know, I'm going to I'm going to supplant a veteran this year. Like it's going to happen. Um, he was very good at rookie minicamp. He looked sharp. Uh, he looked prepared, um, which isn't surprising. You know, he spent, I think the last three off seasons with Jordan Palmer, the, the quarterback guru getting him ready for the NFL. So I don't, you know, I, I would be surprised if he's the week one starter, but, um, I think the opportunity is there for him to, to start the, the majority of games this year. Um, particularly with Marcus Mario, you know, the injury history, um, this is still a bad offensive line. So, uh, unfortunately for Mariota, we have to play the Rams in week two. So, uh, if he, you know, if he doesn't come out of that game healthy, then we might see Ritter pretty, pretty early. So, okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so even the, even, so even if there's a situation, like you said, if there's an injury, it's not going to be Frank's, they're going to go no. with Ritter. It's going to be Ritter. Yeah. It's Ritter. Um, and- yeah, I, you know, I think they'll keep Franks around as a practice squad guy, maybe if they keep a third quarterback, um, because he's sort of I think Franks makes more sense as a backup for the group of quarterbacks they have now than he did for Matt Ryan, sort of, you know, another athlete yeah. uh, at quarterback. And and I think, you know, Franks maybe has the upside of, of a long term backup. I think he's worth developing, certainly. Um, but I don't think he's anywhere near ready in terms of Desmond Ritter, uh, mentally like Ritter, just he's, that's his thing. Like he was always going to be the guy that came in and it was the most NFL ready from the beginning. That was why I think a lot of scouts thought he might be the first quarterback taken is because he, he is so ready and he's got more upside than Kenny Pickett, uh, who's also one of the more NFL ready guys. But, um, you know, it, it's sort of, can he clean up the accuracy stuff? Um, is it mental? You know, is it physical? What is the issue there? 
uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, but he's a hard worker, so if he can get it done, I, I think he will. And look, getting all these six five targets, you know, maybe the accuracy isn't that important then. So, well, yeah, <laughs> at least he's got some good deep ball accuracy, yeah. and yeah. he's athletic. That, those oh, yeah. are, that, that's like the NFL: throw the deep ball and have an athlete quarterback. Mm-hmm. You no, know, he checks those two boxes and a bunch of others as well. And all right, so Mariota doesn't, and I'm sure we'll talk about this again on our preview, but Mariota doesn't get hurt. Is it just going to be, okay, once we're out of this, you know, once we're one in five, that kind of <laughs> thing, then we're pretty much going to go with Ritter. That, that's yeah, how it's going to work. Yeah, I would, I would say that I would be surprised if he wasn't starting by week 10, Ritter. Okay. Um, and and, and and let, the, the reason it wouldn't happen is if the Falcons are miraculously good, uh, which would probably qualify as a miracle. So, um, you know, well, we'll see how that goes. I, I'm doubtful of that. But uh, if they well, are the good, Giants it made might... that move uh, with right. Manning when they yep. had Kurt Warner. And I think they were almost a 500 team at that, that year. So, yeah. so, you know, we'll see. I, I do think we'll see him uh, sooner than later. All right. St- uh, staying on offense uh, with the last offensive pick was Justin Schaefer out of Georgia. And not many people know about Schaefer, but this is an this is a to me I think he's an under radar under the radar prospect. You know, he's one of those guys that I know he's not a gradable prospect in the RLADS guide, but doing your research on him, there's there, there are things to like about Schaefer sticking on your NFL club as one of those maybe long term backups. Yeah, I mean, really good run blocker. That was sort of his bread and butter. Um, so the Falcons are going to run the ball a lot this year. So look, if you're going to stick as a rookie, if you can do one thing really well, um, that's going to help you. Uh, as a pass protector, he's got he's got work to do, um, certainly. But I think, look, if you can come in and just be a really good run blocker at left guard, run a lot of stuff to the left side, uh, that's going to help you make it. So I, I think this team is moving more towards that balanced attack um and i I think having a good run blocker to back up uh your your line you know i don't know that he's really going to factor in like jaylen mayfield was really bad last year so maybe there's a chance that he's just better than jaylen mayfield but um i doubt it Uh, i think they've shown an incredible amount of faith in jaylen mayfield by basically bringing in no competition whatsoever for him so um it's uh it'll be interesting but I, i do think that schaefer has a pretty good chance at the roster what I like about Schaefer is, is he was one of these under-recruited players at a, at a university, at a football program that recruits the hell out of every position. And he just kept staving off the higher recruits. Okay, I may not be as talented as you, but I'm just going to – I'm still – I'm the guy that the team counts on. I'm the guy that they're going to rely on. He's got long arms. Like you said, he gobbles up those defenders, which I'm sure is the reason his nickname is Pac-Man. That always <laughs> helps. Uh, uh, so I think I, I, just for me, I, I just, I think he's a sleeper. I really do. I, I yeah. you know, again, long-term backup at the worst. And it would not surprise me if at some point in the next couple of years, maybe he's even starting. So, yeah. We'll yeah. See. Getting, getting West Schweitzer vibes from this, uh, another six round pick guard that the Falcons took oh, ended up being go. a starter. Like so it. yeah, some West Schweitzer vibes there. Georgia too. Got yep. the hometown kind of deal. Oh, yeah. We got two dogs in this draft. You know how many dogs the Falcons had taken uh, prior to this draft in the last decade? No. <laughs> One. So One. they doubled their dog quota already wow. this, this decade. Okay. So. <laughs> there you go. Uh, by the way, the only other player that I wanted to mention on offense, and you can throw in another player or two of the rookies that were signed, uh, was Tyler Vrabel, the offensive tackle, the son of Mike. Yep. Uh, so uh, just your prototypical practice squad kind of guy, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, besides Vabral, and you can comment on him, were there any other offensive rookie free agents they signed that we should keep an eye on? Yeah, there's a couple. Inter- I do like Vrabel. Um, I, you know, I, he's a guy that might be a guard convert considering his length didn't measure out as, as good as some expected. Um, but I think as a guard, he's he's definitely someone who has long-term upside. You always love coaches, kids. The, you know, those guys are going to work. So, um, and then... They had a Kentucky offensive tackle, Dare Rosenthal, in in minicamp as a tryout. He didn't actually get an invite, but I know people really liked Dare Rosenthal. Uh, thought he was a draftable player, certainly, and he didn't get a signing after rookie minicamp. So uh, I'm guessing there must be, you know, more concerns there with him uh, that that are keeping him from making a roster. But um, there were some receivers that were intriguing. Um, the uh, the lacrosse player. Uh, Jared, uh, Jared Bernhard, 
Uh, he's going to play, I guess, wide receiver and, and return kicks in camp. So we'll see if he can stick. I also liked uh, Stanley Barry Hill. He's a good receiving sort of end of the roster prospect. And uh, Tyshawn James, the size, speed, athlete guy. Um, so those those guys are certainly interesting on the offensive side. All right. Let's go on defense because you were talking about the need for maybe grabbing an edge rusher early. Nobody but would have been shocked if uh, Jermaine Johnson was the, was the pick. Uh, very surprised that he ended up uh, yeah, late yeah. in the first round. As a Jet fan, I'm happy about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but to get Arnold Ibikiti in round two was a nice pickup. You know, a lot of experience. Just one year at Penn State, though. So, not only Ibikiti, but then to be able to also pick up D'Angelo Malone, another edge rusher. In round three, another uh, very experienced four-year starter and two-time Conference USA Defensive Player of the Year. So I think the combination of uh, Ibikiti and Malone, I I was very pleased to see what they were able to get there, uh, considering they didn't use up a first-round draft pick and in a position that we know is just such a big deal uh, and, and such a big need for Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, Ebikati is nominally the starter already. Um, (laughs) Certainly the highest upside guy they have. I mean, they did sign Lorenzo Carter, um, who's who's certainly someone that that has potential as well. Uh, But but Ebikati's... Yeah, another dogs. We're getting some dogs in here finally. So I know I know a lot of Georgia fans were very upset they hadn't taken a lot of dogs prior to this season. So um, yeah, I think Ebikati is going to walk into the starting job opposite (laughs) Lorenzo Carter. Um, and he's going to have an opportunity to, to play right away, uh, especially as a pass rusher. Um, and I like the pick. I like to pick a lot. He's, he's a good player. Um, just really smart, uh, and has thrived against higher competition, like came from temple to Penn state and immediately put up his best season, uh, against the higher level. So hopefully he'll continue that trend in the NFL. Uh, D'Angelo Malone, a guy who was really impressive at the senior bowl, uh, notably, uh, whooped Trevor Penning a couple of times. This little, this little guy, uh, put, you know, six, uh, six, eight Trevor Penning on his butt, uh, just by getting up under his pads. And he's Malone's thing is he just converts speed to power really well. He looks like a, a small edge rusher, but, um, he's just really good at converting that speed to power and getting up under guys pads and, and using his leverage. Um, so I hope we see that against the saints in week one, D'Angelo Malone getting up <laughs> under Trevor Penning there too. But, uh, He's he's probably someone that's going to be more of a designated pass rusher in his rookie year, um, just because you know the the they're gonna he's gonna maybe struggle against the more experienced NFL tackles against the Especially run. the power ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, those guys that are just huge hulking dudes. Um, but I think they need the pass rush help more than they need to help against the run. So I think getting another really good pass rushing candidate in here, uh, even if he's just a pass rushing specialist, is, was desperately needed. So. All right, and then uh, in between, speaking of defense, the team added Troy Anderson out of Montana State in the second round. And, I mean, this guy's all over the place. So, <laughs> well, first of all, he's a four-year starter, another four-year starter. But he's, he's he, he, taking a look at uh, our lads and his scouting report here. So he's a 2017 freshman of the year as a running back, an outside yep. linebacker. He switches to quarterback and was all-conference. Uh, then he goes to full-time linebacker since 2019. He can go outside or inside and, and played in their four, two, five defense, uh, with that FCS program. Uh, but here's an interesting, uh, I guess you could say quote, while there is inconsistency and in holes in his play, his athletic ability and speed, give him the chance to develop into a solid every down linebacker, a team that likes his upside and their ability to develop him could take a shot fairly early, which is exactly what Atlanta did. So what stuck out the most about Troy Anderson to take him as high as the second round? He's he's an unprecedented athlete. Um, you know, he's a perfect 10, according to relative athletic score, uh, linebacker. Uh, so that that testing has never been seen before the position. I mean, I think uh, I had we had a friend of ours at the site run his testing through RAS uh, at every position. And he's he's a uh, 94th percentile athlete or better at every single NFL position, including offensive line, which is bizarre considering <laughs> he's only weighs like 250 pounds. Yeah. But, um, you know, he, he is like if if Kyle Pitts was the unicorn on offense, you know, Anderson is the unicorn on defense. Um, and he's raw, certainly at linebacker. Um, the tackling technique is not great. 
uh, the, the physicality is still developing, but the want to is clearly there. He's a guy that's going to, I think, work hard. Um, again, when you're someone who's played four or three or four positions uh, in four years at, at college and, and been basically all conference at every single one, I mean, this is clearly a really smart, quick learning player uh, who's going to be able to develop uh, and learn. But I mean, just athletically, he, he, there's nothing he can't do. Like there's no reason he's faster than Kyle Pitts. Uh, he's by like 0.2, you know, 0.02. Uh, so it's not like much, but this is a guy, if you want someone to match up in man coverage on Kyle Pitts, there's, there's maybe one other linebacker who might have a chance, uh, in terms of size and speed, you know, maybe like a, a Luke Keekley or a Bobby Wagner would have a chance, but, uh, Anderson is is sort of an unprecedented athlete, and we'll see how quickly he's able to to get up to speed. But I think he can have a, an early role as, like I said, a man coverage guy. Because, look, you're going to be like, hey, Troy, uh, go go line up on uh, George Kittle. Just go cover him in man coverage. Just just yeah. chase him. Just chase him around. Um, and you know, there's not a lot of no. there's not a lot that goes into that. You don't have to know this you know detailed scheme to go chase somebody. So I think he's also going to be just this elite special teams player this year. Sure. Like. Um, so we'll see how quickly he gets up to speed, but I wouldn't count him out of starting this year just because, I mean, look at his college career. They're like, Hey, you're a running back. Also, can you, can you maybe play quarterback? Yeah, sure. All conference. So it, it's, it, you know, I, I, I wouldn't count him out. I think that they just love his, uh, his, they, they love his character. They love his makeup. And obviously you have to love the athletic ability. So, um, shout out to Montana state, by the way, Bozeman's a great town. So, all right. <laughs> I've never been there. That sounds like oh, a good place lovely. I'd like to go. Lovely, yeah. Big Sky, too. All great. Uh, and yeah, because Deion Jones, it was not like he was coming off a great year. So Anderson's going to get traded. the playing time. Yeah. he's he's uh, Deion Jones is probably getting traded post-June 1st, considering they just signed another uh, starting linebacker in Nick Kwiatkowski. So. Okay. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here. No, yeah. no Deion Jones. His <laughs> probably days are not. numbered. Yeah. Could be going to the Jets uh, from what the rumblings are. So heard you guys might need a linebacker so uh linebacker is definitely <laughs> one of the positions that they did yeah. not go after they they mm -hmm. they're relying on some of those younger yeah. guys from last year so mm -hmm. yeah i was kind of surprised so yeah then maybe that does make sense yeah okay. he's got the Ulbrick connection so there you go oh yep i like it all right mm -hmm. i'll has that already been uh has new york picked up picked up those rumors yet I don't know, maybe, but uh, I'll yeah, have go to check for it. it out. Yeah. <laughs> if not, I'll start them. Yep. In New York, or at least for the Jets media. All yeah. right. Uh, let's talk about the kids that were signed on defense. So uh, two guys stood out to me. One, since I'm a Michigan fan, was Brad Hawkins. Uh, not that I was surprised. I wasn't really surprised that he wasn't drafted. It's very interesting because when he was playing his last couple of years, or going into his senior year or his last year, there was a lot of talk about how good Brad Hawkins was. And I never bought into it. I just thought, you know, he's a good player, but definitely a player that I think is a, an add-on as a rookie free agent signing. I could see him latching on into some sort of a role with the team, um, if not to begin, of course, in practice, on the practice squad. But the guy that really sticks out to me is Nate Landman. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. I'm a big Nate Lamb and fan based on his history. Unfortunately, the major injury he had to his knee kind of just screwed everything up. And that's yeah. why he wasn't drafted. So maybe give him a little bit of time to get back to being healthy. And maybe the team has something there. I know he's not going to cover people like Troy Anderson, <laughs> but, you know, maybe that inside thumper that yep. Yep. every team can use on early downs. Uh, but you got to get him healthy first. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that signing. Um, you know, you think that hopefully in time he can get back to to closer to what he was pre-injury, but it's going to take some some time and some rehab. Um, certainly wasn't bad over the last few, you know, over no. the last year w uh, with the injury, but wasn't the same. Um, but again, like if, if Deion Jones does get traded, there's an easy path to him being the fifth linebacker. Um, you know, that there's not... Like they've got Michael Walker, uh, who who has been promising and also a really good special teamer. Obviously, they they signed uh, Rashawn Evans from Tennessee, lots of experience with DMP, so you'd have to think he's going to be a starter too. They just signed, like I said, Nick Kwiatkowski from uh, the Raiders and Bears, um, so you have to think he's going to factor in there. But otherwise, it's it's Troy Anderson, the rookie, 
Uh, and then just a bunch of other UDFA types. You know, they have Dorian Etheridge, who made the roster last year as an undrafted free agent, more of a special teams player. So there's certainly a path for for Landman to be the fifth linebacker if Deion Jones gets traded. But if he needs more time uh, to recover, you know, certainly a, a favorite for the practice squad. Um, in terms of the other guys, yeah, I haven't I haven't watched Brad Hawkins, um, so I can't comment on that. But I, I know he does have fans. And certainly the production was solid. So I think he's got a chance at the practice squad as well. Um, Derek Tangelo, the uh, Penn State defensive tackle. I like him. I think he okay. he he has an opportunity maybe to, to sneak onto the roster, but probably more of a practice squad guy. I know um, Timmy Horn, uh, the nose tackle. Some people were, were having, having some, uh, some hype for him as well. So we'll see. Um, and then I know uh, Kwoni Deng, uh, the... Uh, USC linebacker edge hybrid. Uh, he was signed as a UDFA, just this like huge guy. I think he's like six six two fifty. Um, can play all four linebacker spots, you know, inside outside. So I know he has some some fans as well. So we'll see if he can turn into anything. And uh, we can kind of close with the punter. So because yes. anytime you see that, I mean, the first thing when I saw that they signed this punter from Portland State, I was like, okay, I never heard of him, but that must mean something. And sure enough, it does because they really don't have a punter. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Seth Vernon is the favorite to be the punter, to be honest with you. Now, Dom Maggio to his credit has stuck around for like three years. Like he never makes it to the, to the field, (laughs) but he does keep getting invited to camp. So they must like him. Um, but Seth Vernon, I think, um, he was like one punt attempt per, he was like point, zero two pun attempts per game from qualifying for the NCAA's uh like metrics oh. last year. Um so I think he missed a couple games. But uh he was if he had qualified, I think he would have been like the second or third highest punt average or something like that. Uh, I think he had like a forty four point nine yard uh, punt average. And then for his career he has a forty four point six punt average. So that's very good numbers he's also huge i think he's like six five two forty so that's always nice for your special teams you got you have your punter go run down and as is bigger than any returner and you know he's apparently a great athlete <laughs> former receiver so yeah. um i like it i i think he he honestly you could maybe say he's even with dom maggio maybe even the favorite to be the punter but uh certainly they didn't they didn't end up drafting one i know a lot of people thought they might um you know, considering there was a lot of really good punters in this class, but the punters actually went fairly early. So, um, you know, the Falcons decided to wait, and I think they got Seth Vernon, who could surprise and actually make the roster. All right. So we'll uh, find out how that goes when we talk again uh, right around preseason. Um, Lastly, last year at this time, I was asking about what I just asked you about, some of these rookie free agents, guys that really nobody knows much about. So, for, for fans that are gearing ready for training camp in a couple of months, are there any players that were young last year? Maybe they've just played in the practice squad. Maybe they got a year or two of experience on the team, but they haven't developed completely yet. That could take that next step to keep an eye on in this camp. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, Drew Dahlman, who was their fourth round pick last year. Okay. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he, found his way into the starting lineup at left guard uh-huh. or center. I mean, I think honestly, Matt Hennessy is going to be the center. I think he's, he's fine, but um, you know, Jalen Mayfield, they didn't really bring any competition for him and we'll see if that changes, but if they don't, I think Dalman may be his primary competition. Uh, Dalman was like an elite athlete at uh, center. And then if you run his numbers at guard, he's an equally, I mean, he's almost as good. I think he's like a 97th percentile athlete at guard too. So, um, you know, I think he's got a chance, certainly. Uh, I do like... Uh, I'm still a big fan of Austin Trammell from last training camp. More more of a slot receiver. Um, he got hurt during training camp and just had a really hard time making the roster. But he stuck around on the practice squad all season and then got another futures contract to come back. So um, it'll be tough for him to make the roster once again. But I think this is a guy that can play special teams, can return kicks. So th- I think he's got a chance. Um but if you're looking for like fantasy sleepers uh, in terms of like late round picks, I think Demir Bird, the the veteran they signed, I think he has a chance to be one of their starters. Um, he's the speedster. 
uh, you know, the lightning to the thunder of, of Drake London and Brian Edwards and those guys. And I think he actually will have a role. I don't know that it will be a high role, but if you're like a best ball player, uh, Demir Bird could have some games where he catches a couple deep bombs. And, and do you think he, so you think he's going to play more than Tate? That's sort of how I'm feeling, because I feel like Tate's going to be the backup to Drake London. But if London and Edwards are healthy, uh, I don't know that Tate might not even be active in that scenario just because Tate doesn't really play special teams. I do think Tate's going to make the roster still, but um, it, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens in training camp. You know what happens? I know uh, Caterell Hodge is just a really good special teamer, so it'll be interesting to see if they sort of prioritize that or the receiving ability. Obviously, Tate has the advantage there in a big way. Yeah, you were um, t- talking about size. I mean, Auden Tate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, huge, huge. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I would be shocked if Tate didn't make the roster, but I, I do wonder if they'll use Bird a little bit more or maybe Bird and will be active more frequently than Tate as long if the other guys are healthy. Because after Brian Edwards got traded for, you know, you sort of see you've got Drake London and you've got Brian Edwards and you've got Demir Bird, who is the speedster. Um, and then you've also got Alameda Zacchaeus, who they really like. So it's starting to get actually to the point where, like, the, the Falcons might actually, you know, have have something resembling an NFL receiving core now. So it's, it's been, it's been a big change for us. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for sure. That's the last time we spoke too. Yeah. 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 Um, and then actually uh, the, the team did not really pick up any DBs in, right. in the draft. Because mm-hmm. Casey Hayward Correct. was a nice addition in free yep. agency, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that also because they're now expecting those guys they drafted last year to start to make more of an impact? Yeah, they did re-sign Isaiah Oliver, who was actually really, really good as the slot corner until he got hurt, I think, in like week five. Um, so they're, they're starting three now actually looks really good uh, with A.J. Terrell, Casey Hayward, who you mentioned, and, and Oliver coming back. And then, like you said, they have Darren Hall. Uh, who you think is probably going to be one of the top backups. And then Avery Williams, you know, probably going to be more of their their returner he was actually a pretty good returner ended up taking over for patterson last year because they needed patterson to play offense um but uh yeah i mean i i think that group is is fairly settled i mean they added a couple other guys like tease tabor um you know they added mike ford who's more of a special teamer and they signed just a bunch of futures guys like the uh cory ballantyne i think is like a former sixth rounder uh cornell armstrong um, Lafayette Pitts, you know, they just added a lot of sort of journeyman, you know, sort of practice squad caliber guys to sort of duke it out. Um, so we'll see who shakes out of that group. But I think that starting three and Darren Hall is probably like your, your, your top guys. So does, does, is Grant going to start? That's the hope. He better start. <laughs> Cause I'm looking at our lads yeah. and they have Dean Marlowe. Yeah, I mean, Marlowe started... Where, so he's like the veteran that will just be yeah. there if, if somebody doesn't step up. Yeah, that's my... I mean, I would probably say that... that I mean, Marlowe, look, he started eight games for the Lions last year. He was fine. Um, they re-signed Eric Harris, so they have another guy. Eric Harris was way better than anybody thought last year. He was like their best safety. Um, then they also have Jalen Hawkins, who stepped up and played a starting role, and Richie Grant. So, I mean, if I'm thinking it's probably going to be Richie Grant and Jalen Hawkins as the starters, or at least that's what they hope because those are your young guys, but they do have really good depth there with Eric Harris and Dean Marlowe. So if, sure. if Richie Grant needs more time or whatever, or there's an injury, you know, they, they actually, that four deep safety group is pretty deep. You know, it's obviously not elite or, or like approaching the top of the NFL, but certainly a quality top to bottom safety group there. And no other free agents, notable free agents that they can afford to bring in or they will bring in at all. You think if they trade Deion Jones, they'll have a lot of money, like $10 million uh, added from that. So, We'll see. I I would be surprised if they didn't bring in someone else. I mean, to me, I would think they'd bring in a left guard. <laughs> that's that's what I would bring in. <laughs> um, maybe another edge guy. How about you know, Eric Flowers? Yeah, yeah, maybe Eric Flowers. I know uh, Quentin Spain is still out there. He uh, has played with with uh, Arthur Smith before. Actually, he was like one of the only good interior linemen for the Bengals last year. Um, so you know, and he's not gonna be expensive either. Sort of yeah. a journeyman guy. Um, so you know, there's definitely some options there. Edge maybe. Um, if they're looking for another veteran to sort of pad out that group, I know Trey flowers, speaking of flowers, uh, another, another guy that's still out there. And then, um, defensive tackle, everyone's been talking about Akeem Hicks and yeah, everybody wants signing Akeem all the form. Every, yeah. The Falcons have been signing every former bear in existence. So, you know, maybe Akeem Hicks somehow winds up in Atlanta and I, I would certainly not hate that at all. So, no. yeah, he's, he's a good player. 
Okay, so that'll wrap it up. Uh, great job as always, Kevin, and uh, can't wait to start talking uh, fantasy football as well. We've got our dynasty draft that we're going to be doing at some point, a rookie draft that we'll be doing in the next few weeks once we set it up. Uh, and again, when we talk again, it will be right around preseason unless something major happens. In the meantime, uh, for Atlanta fans, again, you can check out YouTube, and I have it. Uh, I have that as one of the channels. Uh, premier channels on my channel that you can link up to. So again, that's over at Falcoholic Live. It's real easy to find over on YouTube. And right now it's just, did you say two days a week? Yeah. Yeah. We'll have stuff usually early in the week and then Wednesday night is the live show. All right. Awesome. Uh, next step, like I said, is the draft for you and I uh, in fantasy football, but we'll talk to you again during the preseason. Most likely Kevin can't wait for that as well. Uh, that yes. means that we're almost uh, ready for the start of the season. So can't wait to talk to you again. Yes, yes. We got to get through June first. So yeah, I know <laughs> that's, that's the tough. That's the tough. Yep. Loss. Yeah. For football. Yep, fans. The dead zone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. Thanks.